The next chapter is the professor. He was eight years old. A telegram came from the hospital. And since his father, a Russian immigrant, could not read English, Maury had to break the news, reading his mother's death notice like a student in front of the class. We regret to inform you, he began. On the morning of the funeral, Maury's relatives came down the steps of his tenement building on the poor Lower East Side of Manhattan. The men wore dark suits and the women wore veils. The kids in the neighborhood were going off to school, and as they passed, Maury looked down, ashamed that his classmates would see him this way. One of his aunts, a heavyset woman, grabbed Maury and began to wail. What will you do without a mother? What will, you be what will become of you? Maury burst into tears. His classmates ran away. At the cemetery, Maury watched as they shoveled dirt into his mother's grave. He tried to recall the tender moments that they shared when she was alive. She had operated a candy store until she got sick, after which she mostly slept or sat by the window looking frail and weak. Sometimes she would yell out for her son to get some medicine. And young Maury, playing stickball in the street, would pretend he did not hear her. In his mind, he believed he could make the illness go away by ignoring it. How else can a child confront death? Maury's father, whom everyone called Charlie, had come to America to escape the Russian army. He worked in the fur business, but was constantly out of a job. Uneducated and barely able to speak English, he was terribly poor, and the family was on public assistance much of the time. Their apartment was dark and cramped, depressing place behind the candy store. They had no luxuries, no car. Sometimes to make money, Maury and his younger, younger brother, David, would wash porch steps together for a nickel. After their mother's death, the two boys were sent off to a small hotel in the Connecticut woods where several families shared a large cabin and a communal kitchen. The fresh air might be good for the children and the relatives. I thought, Maury and David had never seen so much greenery, and they ran and played in the fields. One night after dinner, they went for a walk and it began to rain. Rather than come inside, they splashed around for hours. The next morning when they woke up, Maury hopped out of bed. Come on, he said to his brother, get up. I can't. What do you mean? David's face was panicked. I can't move. He had polio. Of course, the rain did not cause this, but a child at Maury's age, Maury's age could not understand. For a long time, as his brother was taken back and forth to special medical home and was forced to wear braces on his legs, which left him limping, Maury felt responsible. So in the morning, he went to the synagogue by himself because his father was not a religious man and he stood among the swaying men in their long black coats, and he had asked God to take care of his dead mother and his very sick brother. And in the afternoons, he stood at the bottom of the subway steps and hawked magazines, turning whatever money he made over to his family so that they could buy food. In the evenings, he watched his father eat in silence, hoping for, but never getting, a show of affection, communication, warmth. At nine years old, he felt as if the weight of a mountain were on his shoulders. But a saving grace came into Maury's life the following year, his new stepmother, Eva. She was a short Romanian immigrant with plain features, curly brown hair, and the energy of two women. She had a glow that warmed the otherwise murky atmosphere his father created. She talked when her new husband was silent. She sang songs to the children at night. Maury took comfort in her soothing voice and her school lessons, her strong character. When his brother returned from the medical home, still wearing leg braces from the polio, the two of them shared a rollaway bed in the kitchen of their apartment, and Eva would kiss them goodnight. Maury waited on those kisses like a puppy waits on milk, and he felt deep down that he had a mother again. There was no escaping their poverty. However, they lived now in the Bronx and in a one-room bedroom in a one-bedroom apartment in a red brick building on Tremont Avenue next to an Italian beer garden where the old men played bocce on summer evenings. Because of the depression, Maury's father found even less work in the fur business. Sometimes when the family sat at the table, all Eva could put out was bread. What else is there, David would ask. Nothing else, she would answer. And she, when she would tuck Maury and David into bed, she would sing them Yiddish. Even the songs were sad and poor. There were one about a girl trying to sell her cigarettes. This is supposed to be a song. Please buy me cigarettes. They are dry, not wet by rain. Take pity on me. Take pity on me. Still, despite their circumstances, Maury was taught to love and to care and to learn. 
Eva would accept nothing less than excellence in school because she saw education as the only anecdote to their poverty. She herself went to tonight school to improve her English. Maury's love for education was hatched in her arms. He studied at night by the lamp on the kitchen table, and in the mornings he would go to the synagogue to say Kaddish, the memorial prayer for the dead, for his mother. He did this to keep her memory alive. Incredibly, Maury had been told by his father never to talk about her. Charlie wanted young David to think Eva was his natural mother. It was a terrible burden for Maury. For years, the only evidence Maury had that his mother was... Sorry, the only evidence Maury had of his mother was the telegram announcing her death. He had hidden it, hidden it the day it arrived. He would keep it the rest of his life. When Maury was a teenager, his father took him to a fur factory where he did work. This was during the Depression. The idea was to get Maury a job. He entered the factory and immediately felt the walls had closed in around him. The room was dark and hot and the windows covered with filth and the machines were packed tightly together, churning like train wheels. The fur hairs were flying, creating a thickened air. And the workers, sewing the pellets together, were bent over their needles as the boss marched up and down the rows, screaming for them to go faster. Maury could barely breathe. He stood next to his father, frozen with fear, hoping that the boss wouldn't scream at him too. During the lunch break, his father took Maury to the boss and pushed him in front of him, asking if there was any work for his son. But there was barely enough work for the adult laborers, and no one was going to, no one was giving it up. This for Maury was a blessing. He hated this place. He made another vow that he kept to the end of his life. He would never do any work that exploited someone else, and he would never allow himself to make money off the sweat of others. What will you do? Eva asked him. I don't know, he said. He ruled out law because he didn't like lawyers, and he ruled out medicine because he didn't like the sight of blood. What will you do? It was the only thought, mm, it was only through default that the best professor I ever had became a teacher. Instead of this being a flashback, it's a quote, and it says, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. And that's a quote by Henry Adams. <laughs>